So uh, today we're going to move on, uh, continuing to discuss fluids, but another topic in fluids. Uh, but of course, before I get to that, I just wanted to remind everyone that tonight, 11.59 p.m., the homework uh, assignment is due on Bernoulli's uh, equation, Bernoulli's principle. Uh, and so before I move on, are there any questions about uh, what we've been discussing in the previous lectures regarding Bernoulli's equation and, and the pipe systems and things like that? Yes, sir. I had a question about how we would work um, a problem with height. Like I got the first part, but it's when we have to subtract at like the end of the equation, height minus height, something like that. Right, right. Okay, so let's say we have something that looks like this. We have a pipe system and it goes down a certain distance at the end. And we're told that the uh, pipe falls a distance of let's say 20 meters. And then we have other information about the pipe system, but just to deal with the height by itself, when we do Bernoulli, what we would have is your P1 plus one half row V1 squared plus row G H1. And then the same for the two side. And uh, likely the question may be asking something like uh, calculate the difference in pressure or the change in pressure. So you'll solve for P2 minus P1, which will leave you with something like this, one half rho V1 squared minus one half uh, rho V2 squared plus rho G H1 minus rho G H2. And then you do whatever work it is you need to do to get all these numbers, blah, blah, blah. The question is, what about these terms here? The terms that talk about the height change. Because as you can see here, we're not really told the actual heights of our pipe. I don't know what the top height is. I'm not told, oh, the, top of the pipe starts 40 meters above the ground and then drops down to 20 meters above the ground. We don't know anything like that. All we know is that wherever the pipe starts, it eventually falls 20 meters lower than where it started. Well, the good news is that uh, the way this particular equation works is very similar to how law of conservation of energy worked where if you're sliding down a hill or something like that, or you're lifting uh, uh, a set of weights up, you know, four or five feet, whatever it is, or you're, you're lifting a book onto the table and you talk about how does the potential energy change? Potential energy, of course, dealt with the height as well. And what we found was, say we have the example of lifting up a book to place it onto a table. So you would have something like, um, you know, the potential energy is mgh, and so if I'm if I've got the book on the floor and then I want to put it on the table up here, and let's say the table is four feet high, then we would say the potential energy makes the book go from zero meters, the ground level, up to the four foot level. Okay. But then one could say, well, wait a second, how do you know you're not in uh, an apartment building and you're on the third floor? So the book, although it started on the floor, is not the true ground level of the earth. It's just the floor, which is already 30 feet above the ground level. Don't you have to take that kind of stuff into account? And the, the answer is no, we don't have to take it into account. All that matters is how will the height change? And in this particular little example, the height changes by four feet. In our pipe system, it changes by 20 meters. You can, you have the ability or you have the option to choose what you want the numbers to actually be. So for instance, with the book, uh, if I want to make the actual earth's ground be ground level, 
then the floor of my third story apartment would be 30 feet. And then I'm gonna lift it up to 34 feet. So I'd have height one is 30 and height two is 34. Or much easier than that is instead I could say, I don't care where the actual ground level is. My book only knows that it's going from the floor to the table. So since the floor is the lowest part, let's call that the zero foot mark. And then the table is four feet. So now we'd have height one being zero and height two being four. And it turns out that we'd get the exact same answer if we did this. And so th that's what we're gonna do for the pipe system. I don't know where my pipe actually is. I don't know where sea level is or anything like that for the earth. All I know is the pipe started at some location and then it dropped 20 meters lower. So what I would be doing for a problem like that is I would say, okay, let's look at the lowest part of my problem. Well, the lowest part is down here at the bottom where the pipe ends up. And I'm gonna call the lowest part, the zero height part. So I would call H2 zero meters because that's as low as it gets. Nothing goes lower than that. So may as well call that the ground. But then if I do that, I now know the, this part up here, which is my height one, has to be 20 meters above whatever I chose height two to be. So I would call H1 now 20. So the ground level is the lowest part and then everything else we know from the problem. So why is pH two zero? H2 is zero because since the, the pipe is going from the top down to the bottom, the original height is up some distance and the end of the pipe, the, the part two stuff is at the lowest level. And I always choose the lowest level is always zero meters. I just call that the ground. Gotcha. And so I call H2 here zero and H120. Now, if I were going the other way, you know, if you have a pipe that goes up, like that, and you have the same thing, the pipe lifts up 20 meters. Well, again, I'd still say the, the lowest part is zero, and thus this part up here is 20. And in this case, H1 would be zero, because H1 is where the lowest part is, and H2 would be 20. Okay, so that's basically how you, how you want to handle these types of problems where height is in there. There may be some problems where the, the problem actually tells you the height. They don't just tell you it drops by 20 meters. They'll say uh, the pipe started uh, uh, 20 feet above the ground and then it lifted up to 30 feet above the ground. Well, now you know H1 is 20 and H2 is 30, that's fine. But if you have something like this where you just know how it changes, we'll call one of those heights zero. And the one I call zero is always the lowest one. That's the ground and everything else is relative to that. So does that clear it up for you? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. Any other questions about the Bernoulli stuff before we move on to the next piece? All right, well, just remember uh, the homework's posted on there and it's due tonight. So if you haven't already submitted it, definitely uh, do it uh, <laughs> before you forget so that uh, you'll have credit for it. Now, what we're gonna start today is continuing talking about fluids, but a slightly different topic in fluids. Uh, and what we'd like to get to eventually is Archimedes principle. But before we get to that, we wanna discuss something slightly different. And that has to do with um, what's called the buoyant force. Okay, buoyant force. So there's a term you may or may not have heard of before, which is buoyancy or something is buoyant. Or, uh, hey, out there in the, in the lake, there's a buoy out there. Those all come from the same word. And what it basically deals with is uh, 
an object's ability to float when it's in a liquid, let's say, or in a, a fluid in general. So if something is buoyant, then it's floating. It's, it has the ability to float in that liquid, in the water or whatever. And the buoyant force is that thing which allows the object to float. Because if we think about it, let's look at the situation. You have a, a liquid, let's say water, and we place an object, let's say some ice cubes, and an ice cube floats in the water. Well, this is kind of strange if you think about it, because notice, especially from physics one, gravity acts on everything. So there's some gravity. Of course, gravity is pulling down on the water. The water thus is, you know, on the ground. But the ice cube, gravity is also pulling on the ice cube with its weight, the force of its weight, trying to pull it down to the ground. But if it's in this water, it's not falling to the ground, it's floating, it's staying up above the ground somehow. Well, we know from Newton's laws, you know, if there's gravity pulling it down, but it's not falling, there must be some other force which is acting on it, which is balancing out gravity or canceling out gravity, we can say. And so whatever this force is, however it derives, that's the force we call buoyant force. That is the thing which allows the object to float. Now, where does it come from? That's what we'd like to kind of get a, a grasp of. Where does this buoyant force come from? Well, it comes from this. Let's say we have an object. Here's our object. And what we know is when an object is placed in a fluid, that fluid will squeeze the object, okay? It'll press on the object. And the reason is pretty obvious if you start to think about it. If the object's not in the water, then the water is just there, okay? It's all over the place. But once I place this box, let's say this is a box into the water, well, I had to move the water out of the way to make room for the box. But of course, the water didn't wanna get moved out of the way. The whole thing about liquids is they kind of, naturally take the shape of whatever vessel they're in. And so I had to force the water away. Well, eventually the water wants to come back to where it was. And so you start to get uh, the water pushing back on this object in all directions, okay? And so we have uh, a force pushing, squeezing this object in all directions. The object is of a certain size. And so what we can consider is the pressure acting on the object. So remember the pressure is just how much force you're acting on it divided by how, how big it is, the size, the area of the object. Well, that's fine. Okay, no problem. But here's the thing. It turns out that how much pressure an object feels in a fluid kind of depends on uh, how deep it is, how far down below the surface. The deeper you go in a fluid, the more pressure you're gonna feel. And one way of thinking about it is to you know, think about this. Uh, if the object's there, then there's like this column of water above the object, which is trying to be pushed down due to gravity, so it's pushing down on the top of this box, thus applying a force or a pressure downwards. And if I'm deeper, then there's even more water above the box trying to fall down. And so there's more weight being placed on the top of the box. That's one way of kind of thinking about why as you go deeper, you feel a higher pressure. There's more water there pushing on you basically. So that tells us there is some relationship between the pressure acting on an object and the depth of the object in the fluid, okay? And a relationship is fairly easy. It goes like this. The amount of pressure the object feels is given by something we've already seen, rho times g times H, 
the same term that was in Bernoulli, this is where it comes from. This is why that term was in Bernoulli. Remember I said Bernoulli's equation is kind of like conservation of energy, where you had kinetic and all the different types of potential and you add them all up and you get a total energy. Well, for Bernoulli, it was instead of energies, it's pressures. You have the pressure, let's say there's a pump, there's a pressure due to how fast the fluid's moving and there's a pressure due to its depth or how high or low the water pipe system is. So here we see the pressure acting on an object in a fluid is related to how deep the object is in that fluid, H being called the depth instead of the height. Usually we think H is height and so it's above. Well, here depth means below, below the surface of the water. And so what this means, as I said, is the deeper you go, the more pressure you feel. This is why um, I think the statistic is something like only 2% of the world's oceans is actually explored by man. There's so much of the oceans we cannot get to. And the reason we can't get to it is, first of all, as a human diver, uh, we can't get close to the kind of depths that exist on Earth. We can only go down a few hundred meters, let's say, before we actually get squished like a, a, a fruit. Whereas uh, we've invented uh, vessels that allow us to go deeper, made of metal, and thus is harder to crush. But even those, as we go deeper and deeper and explore more unknown territories in the water, even metal submarines can be crushed by the pressures. And so there's very little that we actually can get to. And it's all due to this. Now, how, if this is true, that the pressure depends on the depth, notice something about my little example here. The box on the right, sitting there under the water. Well, the top of the box is up here and the bottom of the box is down here. So there's some difference, some delta H, some difference in depth between the top of the box and the bottom. What would that mean? Well, that would mean if we call this H1 and this is H2, that would mean that the pressure on top of the box, call it P1, is rho times G times H1. And the pressure on the bottom of the box, P2, is rho times G times H2. But H2, if we look, is whatever H1 is plus this extra bit of delta H. So I could rewrite it as rho G H1 plus rho G delta H. Okay. So the pressure at the bottom of the box, since the bottom of the box is a little deeper than the top, is whatever the pressure was at the top, plus some extra little bit, okay? And how much more is there? Well, it depends how big the box is. If it's a really, really long box, then there's a big difference between the top depth and the bottom depth. But if it's a little flat box, then they're pretty much the same and you don't see a big difference. But either way, if there's a difference and the bottom, has this extra bit of pressure that the top doesn't have. That means if we look at just the box itself, you'll have pressure from the sides squeezing in, you'll have pressure from the top and you'll have pressure from the bottom, but the bottom has that little extra bit of pressure that the top doesn't have. So, Whatever the top has is canceled out by the bottom, but you have a little bit extra that's not canceled out. So for instance, you could think, oh, there's 10 pounds of force pushing down and there is 12 pounds of force pushing up. Well, the 10 pushing down and 10 of the 12 pushing up cancel, they balance each other, but then you still have two extra pounds still lifting you up. And thus you have some excess force pushing up on the object, and that's called the buoyant force. That is the force which gives rise to things being able to float. 
purely because the bottom of the object has more pressure than the top. You can relate it kind of to the airplanes and the wings on an airplane. They're designed such that the air moves faster over the top than the bottom. Thus, there's more pressure on the bottom than the top. If there's more pressure from the bottom than the top, then there's more force pushing up from the bottom than pulling down from the top. And so you lift up the airplane. Same thing here, an ice cube in water, the bottom of the ice cube is at a lower depth than the top. So there's more pressure at the bottom. Thus, you have excess force pushing up on the ice cube and ice cube floats. But then you say, well, wait a second, if this is true, shouldn't everything float? Surely not everything floats, some things sink. You throw a water into a pond, I mean, a water, you throw a stone into the pond, the stone will sink. Well, what the heck, what's that about? Well, what makes something float or sink is not just the buoyant force, but how big is the buoyant force? If this buoyant force, which is this little bit of extra force pushing up, happens to be bigger than the weight of the object, which is the thing trying to make it fall, then the object will float. There's more force pushing up than there is force pulling down by, by gravity, and so you float. However, it doesn't have to be bigger. You can have an object that weighs a lot and only a little bit of buoyant force is there, so gravity still wins. It's still heavier. There's still more force pulling it down than the buoyant force can handle. So it'll sink. It won't float. And then, of course, there's the extreme, the third option, which is, well, it just so happens that the buoyant force is exactly the same as the weight of the object. And if that's the case, then what you have is the object just stays, sits there. It doesn't float up to the top. It doesn't sink to the bottom. But wherever you place it in the water, it just stays there. Okay. So that's what's going on. It's all about how does the buoyant force compare to the weight of the object? If the buoyant force is larger than the weight of the object, it'll float. If it's less, it'll sink. But either way, it's always there, the buoyant forces. And so one thing this means is that if there's a buoyant force that's always trying to oppose gravity, even though it may not win, that means that any object that's placed into a fluid will always feel lighter than it truly is. And so if you think about like, let's say you're in a swimming pool. Well, while you're in a swimming pool, let's say you're standing on the floor, you could jump up and jump up pretty high, higher than normally you would be able to. Uh, or if you're trying to, let's say you're lifting yourself out of the swimming pool. So you're at the edge of the pool and you start lifting yourself out. And what you find is at, at first, it's really easy. You push yourself or you pull yourself out and uh, you're pretty light, so you're able to do it. But then as you start to get more and more out of the water, you feel more and more heavy and it gets harder and harder to pull yourself out. And the reason is because when you're all the way in the water, then you have as much buoyant force as is possible for your body. And so the buoyant force is really helping you overcome your weight. But as you start to get out of the water, there's less of your body in the water. So there's less buoyant force helping you. And so you feel more and more of your true weight until a such time as you're completely out the water, then it's your actual weight that you're feeling as you're trying to pull yourself up over the edge. And so this concept is what's called the apparent weight, apparent weight. And the apparent weight, so let's say at WAPP, I could write it as, just means how heavy does something feel? Or if you were to measure the weight using a weight scale, what would the weight scale say the weight is? As opposed to the true weight. Okay, the actual weight, we know how to calculate true weight, 
the true weight of an object W is M times G. It's its mass times 9.8 here on earth, let's say. But the apparent weight, how heavy something feels, is always going to be lighter when it's in a water, when it's in the water, let's say. And so how much lighter will it feel? Well, it'll feel its actual weight, the true weight of the object, minus how much buoyant force is acting on it. The more buoyant force you have, the lighter the object's going to feel. If the buoyant force is bigger than the weight, then obviously the object floats and it doesn't feel, it feels weightless to you. It's not heavy at all, it just floats. If the buoyant force is very small, then the object feels just as heavy as it does normally. But notice, no matter what, the apparent weight is always less than the true weight. And so these are things that could be done. And in fact, this becomes a little more important when we discuss Archimedes' principle. But there can be uh, experiments or different things you can do. For instance, let's say you're a naval diver and you're going down to try to uh, uh, salvage a, a sunken ship or maybe, let's say, a treasure. You, you know there's a Spanish uh, boat down under the water and you saw it's got a chest of gold coins in it, and you want to be able to uh, take it out and bring it up to the surface so you could be rich. Well, one thing you may want to find out is how heavy will this chest of gold coins be? Will I be able to lift it, or do I need a machine to help me lift it out of the water? Well, how would you be able to figure it out? Fairly easy. First thing is, if you know, let's say, for whatever reason, you know how much gold is in there, then you know the mass of the thing. So you can calculate the actual weight of the chest. But then you say, okay, well, it's not going to feel that heavy, though, because it's in water. So if you happen to find a way to calculate the buoyant force, which would act on this chest of gold coins, then you know how much lighter it would feel. For instance, the actual weight of the chest is 1,000 pounds. But the buoyant force which acts on it is 600 pounds. So the apparent weight, how heavy the chest would feel to you while you're underwater, is going to be the 1,000 pounds it truly is minus the 600 that the buoyant force helps. So it would only feel 400 pounds heavy rather than 1,000. So a basic calculation, nothing fancy here, but it's definitely something important and something that's useful to know how to do. And in fact, this is kind of related, if you remember the first semester physics, when we talk about uh, elevator problems. If you're standing in an elevator on a weight scale and the elevator starts to move, then the weight scale will think you're heavier or lighter than you truly are based on how the elevator moves. As the elevator accelerates upwards, you get pulled down into the ground, and so you feel heavier than normal. As the elevator falls, accelerates downwards, you get lifted off the ground just a little bit, and so you feel lighter. That's the apparent weight of the person in an elevator. Here, we're talking about inside of a liquid, inside of a fluid. You place an object in there, there will be some buoyant force acting, trying to lift it up. And so there's an apparent weight of the object due to that. All right, any questions about these concepts so far? All right, so the big equations we have is first of all, the pressure depth equation. Pressure is given by rho times G times H. Now we rem remember this rho, this density is not the density of the object, okay? This density is the density of the fluid that the object is in. So for instance, uh, here on earth, if you're just out in the air, the air is a fluid, that's the atmosphere. And so there's a certain amount of pressure the air will push on you. So we're, we already have some amount of pressure acting on us. And so if we want to figure out how much pressure, we would have to figure out the density of the air. But then if I go into water, 
water has a different density and the water will put a different amount of pressure. Or if you're in honey, honey will give a different amount of pressure. So this row is not the density of the thing you put into the water, but rather the density of the water itself. And then G of course is 9.8 if we're here on earth, if you're on another planet or the moon or something like that, then you'd use the gravity for that particular planet. And then H, of course, is the depth. How many meters below the surface of the water are you? Okay. Now, the way I showed it here in this example had to do with the difference between the top of the object and the bottom of the object. That is purely for the conceptual view to understand why there's a buoyant force. Actual problems, we won't worry about the top versus the bottom. All we'll worry about is the fact that an object is somewhere in the water. You know, you, you have a, uh, a, I don't know, a rock is 10 meters below the surface. How much pressure will the rock feel? Well, you don't care that the top of the rock is a little higher than the bottom of the rock. We're not going to focus on that. We're just going to say the rock is this far down. And so that's the depth we use. And that's that. The other equation, which we just saw here, is the apparent weight equation, which is the true weight, mg, minus the buoyant force. For now, until we do Archimedes principle, the buoyant force would be given to you as a number. However, once we get into uh, Archimedes principle and such, then uh, we'll have ways of calculating the buoyant force. And so you would calculate the buoyant force and then put it into this equation. So these are the big equations. Now, one more thing I wanna go over for this class, which is um, kind of a, an important concept to think about especially when we're dealing with actual real world stuff, experimental stuff, or just, you know, if you're going to go scuba diving or you have a flat tire, whatever, there's this other concept, which is important. And it goes like this. If you've ever had a flat tire, which I'm sure everybody has, whether it's in a car or in a bicycle or something like that, you have a flat tire, you need to pump it up. So you get your tire pump, you uh, plug it into the tire and there's a little gauge on the, on the pump that tells you how much pressure uh, the tire is pumped to. Because of course you can't over pump it. If you put too much air in a tire, it'll explode. If you don't put enough, then it's flat and there's a lot more friction that you have to deal with. So you always wanna pump it up to whatever the correct stated pressure for that particular tire is. But if you look at the gauge, when a tire is flat, the gauge will say zero pressure is in the tire. And it kind of makes sense. You say, well, it's flat. Of course, all the air was uh, uh, taken out of the tire. It's, there's no more air in the tire. But we know that's not true. There is some air in the tire, it's whatever air is naturally in the tire, just like if you have a, a glass uh, that's not filled with water or anything, there's some air in that glass, or you have a box, and you close the box, there's air in the box. There's not extra air, but there's some air that something is filling the space, and the same for a tire. Even though the tire is quote unquote flat, all the air, we say all of the air has escaped, but not all of it, just whatever can naturally just stay inside of the tire, just stays in there. So the tire pump says zero pressure, but we know it's not zero pressure because everything on earth, everything, no matter what, always feels what's called the atmospheric pressure. So you sitting there in your chair right now feels a certain amount of pressure on your body due to the atmosphere. Now, how much pressure you feel? Well, it's a number. It's called one atmosphere of pressure. And I believe it's something like 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth or something like this, Pascal's. Uh, 
obviously a big number. 10 to the fifth Pascals is a large number. But we don't notice it. And we don't notice it because we've lived all our lives feeling this pressure all the time. It never goes away. So it's just the, our normal state. And so we just don't notice it. What we notice is when things change. So if I go down underwater, now I start to feel more pressure than there was before. Or you could go into a, a vacuum chamber and they reduce the pressure, then you'll feel less pressure than you normally do. And you feel the difference. But just being on earth, you just feel what, the, what you feel is you don't notice that the air is pushing on you. And the same is for everything. Every object everywhere on earth all feel atmospheric pressure. Obviously, in reality, as you go up on mountains, you feel less pressure than if you're down at sea level. Uh, because there's less air. The air is thinner up there, so it doesn't push on you as hard. But we're talking about, generally speaking, everything feels atmospheric pressure. And so because of that, manufacturers of things like tire pumps and, and the like say, look, no one cares that there's already some pressure on an object, which is atmospheric pressure, because everything feels it, and it's always there. So you don't care about it. What you care about is how much more pressure is acting on the object. So if you have a tire and you need to inflate it to 32 PSI, well, you don't care that there's already, you know, uh, 14 PSI, naturally speaking, you just need 32 more PSI than the, the original. And so what they've developed is what's called gauge pressure. So there's gauge pressure and there's uh, absolute pressure. Absolute pressure is the actual pressure. What does the object feel? What's the actual pressure acting on the object? This is usually uh, atmospheric pressure and then anything you do to the object. So if you send an object down underwater, then the amount of pressure the object feels is atmospheric pressure plus the rho GH term because you went down a certain amount. Gauge pressure on the other hand says, don't tell me anything at all about this atmospheric pressure. For the love of God, everything feels it. I don't need to know that number anymore. It's just understood that everything feels atmospheric pressure. Just tell me the difference. And so gauge pressure would be, let's call it gauge pressure, is the absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure. Or another way of thinking about it is the absolute pressure is atmospheric pressure, what's always there, plus the gauge pressure. Okay, how much extra pressure is there because you're underwater or, or you're up in an airplane or something? Okay, so very similar to apparent weight. Apparent weight, you have your actual weight minus some amount due to the buoyant force. So you feel different. Gauge pressure versus absolute pressure. Gauge pressure is, yes, 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 I know atmospheric pressure is here. But since everything has atmospheric pressure, I'm just going to forget about it and talk about how much difference there is. And so it's the absolute pressure, the true pressure, minus the amount that's due to the atmosphere. And so that's why if you have a tire pump or a scuba gear or something like that, what it's going to show you as pressure, zero pressure is not true zero. It's uh, absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure is zero. So the, the actual pressure is just atmospheric. Another way of thinking about it is this. Scuba gear, you have a, a tank, right? Here's my oxygen tank. Yeah. Kind of bad drawing, but there's my oxygen tank, right? And it's filled with a bunch of oxygen, a whole bunch of oxygen in here. And you start using it, start breathing it. And eventually all the oxygen is used up. We, we say, 
And what you have is a quote, empty oxygen tank. But what's truly happening is the, the tank isn't empty. If the tank was empty, then there's a vacuum in there. Rather, what is there is just the natural air that fills the space. And that's it. The original tank had the natural air that fills the space. And then you pumped a bunch more extra air in there. And so when you breathe it in, you're just taking in all the extra stuff. When it's empty, it's not truly empty. There's still air in there. It's just that it's equalized with the atmosphere. And so it, it seems empty. Like I said, when you have a glass and there's no water in it, we call the glass empty, but it's not really empty. Air is in the glass. Something has to take up the space that's in the glass and it's the air. You fill it with water, the water pushes the air out of the way, and now it's got water in it. You empty the glass, that is you drink the water. It's not now a vacuum in there. All you did was just have the natural atmospheric air in there. Okay, same thing with an oxygen tank. You breathe in the extra oxygen that was pumped into the tank until it's empty, at which point all that's in the tank is just the natural air that can fill it up. But you can't breathe it. You can't steal that because then you're trying to create a vacuum with your lungs and you're not strong enough to do that. So that's the next concept, atmospheric versus gauge pressure. Really easy. It makes sense once you know to look for it. The gauge pressure is how much extra pressure is there. Absolute pressure is all of the pressure added together, which is the gauge pressure plus the amount due to the atmosphere, which is just a number. And this is important because if you're given a question, a homework problem or, or a test problem, you have to look out for what the question's asking. If I say there's a scuba diver 100 meters below the water, what's the absolute pressure felt by the scuba diver? Well, you have to do rho GH to figure out the, the pressure due to his dive how far down he is, but then you also have to include atmospheric pressure as well. Okay, so this rho GH equation is a gauge pressure equation. It doesn't take into account atmosphere. It just says how much more pressure is there. Okay. A question that only wants to gauge pressure, well, don't tell me anything about atmospheric pressure. Just give me the difference, the rho GH, and that's it. All right, so are there any questions about that, gauge pressure versus absolute pressure? All right, well, that's really all I have for today. Kind of an easy day, not too many new things, but getting started into what will become Archimedes principle. Number one, how much pressure does an object feel because of how deep it is under the water? The pressure depth relationship. Number two, the fact that when, a when an object is underwater, it'll feel lighter than if it's just in the air. And that is the apparent weight effect. The fact that there's a buoyant force Trying to lift the object means when you go to lift the object yourself, it's helping you. So to you, the object feels lighter because there's like a hidden person helping you lift the object. It doesn't feel as heavy to you. And then this gauge pressure business, especially if you're going to do anything, uh, you know, in, in the real world, if you're designing equipment or you're doing experiments in the research lab, the difference between gauge pressure and absolute pressure is quite important. And you have to take it into account depending on what it is you're doing. You don't want to have a gauge placed on an oxygen uh, tank that says you still have 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascal's worth of oxygen in the tank, but you know that person can't actually suck the oxygen out of the tank. So you call that the zero point, because at that point, they're not breathing anymore. And that's just one example, but that shows why it's important. 
So anyway, that's all I have for you today. Definitely, as I said, if you haven't submitted the homework, work on it and submit it. Uh, it's only two questions and it's on Bernoulli stuff. So uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't take that long to do. Um, and then just be on the lookout. Of course, I've got uh, last year's recorded lecture is, uh, or lectures are posted on Canvas right now, as well as uh, the current ones we're doing live uh, this semester and the notes, these notes that I write here. So if you ever want to look back or go back and look at uh, what was going on, what examples were there, or if you want to see what I did last year, just to kind of get a slightly different view, maybe a different example problem or two that I'm doing there than I'm doing this time, that's available to you. So make use of it. Uh, if you have any questions about the homework problem uh, as you're working it, feel free to email me and let me know. But definitely get it done so you get credit for, for having the homework. Other than that, that's all I have. We will come back on Thursday and uh, get into Archimedes' principle. So until then, I'll see you later. All right, have a good one. All righty, you too.